<clears throat> so good morning and welcome to the MSSRF uh, seminar series. This morning uh, we have uh, Dr. Jay Raman, uh, who is a senior fellow with the Climate Change uh, uh, Group at the MS Pamela Research Foundation, and he is going to talk about uh, COP27 and give us an overview and the assessments uh, that happened uh, during uh, COP27. Uh, so, um, just to give you a little brief uh, on the abstract, uh, just to uh, give you a brief on the talk. So, um, while the title might seem very simple, the presentation is actually going to look at uh, uh, what kind of undercurrents, uh, you know, were ha happening during the negotiations, and also will give you a little bit of uh, the behind um, the scenes negotiations, and also uh, sheds probably some light on the politics behind these uh, negotiations at COP. Uh, uh, 27. Uh, to introduce the speaker, uh, Professor Jai Raman was with the School of Habitat Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, uh, between 2008 and 2020 before joining uh, the foundation. And he's a member of the Technical Advisory Committee, National Communications to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC. Uh, he's also, uh, and the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. He's also a member of uh, the Indian delegation to several IPCC sessions and the configuration of parties of UNFCCC. Previously, he was a member of the Kerala State Planning Board, Government of Kerala. Uh, Dr. Jairaman's work uh, has been always transdisciplinary uh, in nature and integrates socio-economic aspects based on social sciences within the natural sciences and technological aspects of climate change. And um, the focus is specifically on equity issues at a national and global scale. So we'll have Dr. Jai Raman now. This mic is on. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much. So, since I'm not tethered to the mic, it's okay. Okay, right. So, thank you very much for that uh, introduction, uh, Anita. And uh, uh, let me, without uh, much ado, get into the talk uh, right away. Uh, COP, of course, refers to the Conference of Parties, uh, which is the annual meeting of the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, that is the UNFCC. Uh, the COP need not necessarily meet every year, but it has become a practice that indeed it does meet uh, every year. In fact, uh, COP, it is not necessary that it should conclude its work in the same year. In the past, there have been occasions when the COP has been carried over. But that was much early on and happened, if I remember correctly, only one. So uh, this is a very huge gathering and it involves official delegations and official negotiations. It also involves uh, a great deal of involvement of uh, civil society, of researchers, of philanthropic organizations, and it is divided into two parts, typically called the blue zone, which is more regulated, more official, the green zone, which is much more open. And every year, the number of people who participate there increases. This year, I believe perhaps it was 35,000, but maybe a little less in practice. Not everybody registered comes. So it's quite a unique event. But uh, my focus in this talk will be on the official negotiations, okay? So what happened? What is, see, the background to COP27, there are some very important points about the context. We must uh, uh, rapidly sort of uh, keep in mind. One is that this conference of parties was held particularly in a developing country, Egypt. And uh, Egypt is a unique case where it calls itself the Arab Republic of Egypt. So it has its links with the Arab world. It's also very much part of uh, Africa. 
in its economic and trade linkages as well. So this is a important uh, context. The other important thing is after all the high rhetoric of post uh, COP26 that we heard last year, uh, the uh, scene in Europe has been marked by the conflict, especially in Ukraine. And as a follow, there has been a major impact on energy and food security. Food security affecting mainly developing countries, but energy security coming to bite even the developed countries. So that is another part of the situation. And as a consequence, a real ramping up of the use of oil and gas by the developed countries, despite their high rhetoric at COP26, where they tried to corner developing countries, especially India on the question of coal, etc. But uh, here uh, they are ramping up oil and gas. Uh, the US announced the biggest lease ever in history of oil and gas the month after COP26 was over. And now, of course, uh, the same person who grand, did this grandstanding, the EU Commissioner for Climate, who said, what will I tell my grandchildren after COP26? He was the one uh, six months ago, he said, oh, there is energy security. How can people be without energy? So we need new oil and gas. So, you know, so there's a lot of backsliding. And this has not gone unnoticed in the world. So our criticism from the developing countries has struck a chord in global public opinion. The fourth point was there was a real rising tide of uh, global public opinion on the question of loss and damage. All of us have heard about it. Uh, were compensating countries, especially developing countries for the disasters that strike. The connection with climate change is not always scientifically well-framed, but it did make for a very important, uh, striking a very important chord in public opinion. The other very important part of the context uh, to the COP27 was the appearance of the two working group reports, uh, two and three after COP26. One had appeared before uh, uh, COP26 in August. Working group two and three dealt particularly with adaptation and uh, mitigation. I don't believe we have reviewed two and three uh, in MSSRF. So I think perhaps uh, we should do it on some occasion. This will be an influence for the next five years on policy. So I think it's very important to uh, get an idea of what's in it. So some of the very important highlights, this carbon dioxide emissions, keeping them to the appropriate global carbon budget is the key to keeping temperature rise to the desired limit. So the world is on this carbon budget. Uh, the working group two and three had a major emphasis on equity and climate justice. The equitable sharing of the global carbon budget, which is a global commons, uh, was uh, mentioned. It, the, also, the uh, large differences in cumulative emissions, which of course means that you are eating away the carbon budget, you are consuming it. So the disproportionate uh, uh, use of the global carbon budget by developed countries was very clearly noted. Uh, however, a very important aspect has come to light, which was noted superficially in uh, Working Group 3, that the modeled global mitigation pathways, meaning what should the world do to avoid uh, 1.5 or 2 degrees centigrade, not just keeping within the carbon budget in general terms, but what more particularly what specifically they should do in various sectors and how uh, much emissions reduction should take place. Uh, the working group three made it clear that it was not based on equity or the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities, which are the foundational principles. 
of the UNFCC. Uh, it uh, appeared uh, uh, in a clear way, partly because of the effort that developing country negotiators took in the IPCC. I think our team did uh, provided uh, quite a bit of input into that kind of work. But now we have new work with my colleague, uh, uh, Tejal Kanetkar, her student Akil Maitri, uh, and myself, where we actually show that all these pathways are uh, very suspect because they perpetuate north-south inequalities well into the future. So this part of it has also come up for discussion. Uh, a very important positive aspect of working group two and three is the recognition of the role of public finance and not just private finance, despite what Mr. Kerry was saying throughout last year and this year, uh, as a critical enabler for climate action, especially in adaptation. Uh, and this is a point which we can pick up maybe in discussion, especially in the context of climate policy in India at the center and state levels. Uh, the emphasis in working group two, that reduction in vulnerability in the medium term, that is up to at least 2050, has more to do with socioeconomic development than the differences between how much emissions are taking place. So this is very important and that development matters. So a very important uh, aspect as part of the context, we must remember that India submitted uh, the long-term low carbon development strategy. This is a requirement under the Paris Agreement. Every country should make some declaration of how it is going to proceed with uh, reducing emissions in the long term. So this is available now officially. This is a formal uh, 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 document of the government of India. It is the first concrete specific document, policy document of the government of India on the long-term vision of our climate policy. Unfortunately, it is not well read and I would really urge all of you to take a look at it and we perhaps can have a discussion on it at some point. Uh, then uh, this uh, lists the elements of the transition to low carbon development pathways across six major sectors. It is an ambitious and challenging agenda, but purely in qualitative terms. So what are India's key policy messages from this uh, uh, document? Equity through access to fair and equitable share of the remaining carbon budget. Developed countries must be accountable for their carbon debt, their overconsumption or excessive emissions of the past, either physically by compensating through negative emissions or through monetization of the carbon debt. Now, this, of course, you are aware that several of us have been advocating this idea of the carbon budget and its equitable share as the foundation of global climate policy. Now, this is formally adopted by the government of India as their policy, and this is highlighted in the LTS. Uh, it is not, it is a very important aspect of this is that it is a very clear signal to the developed countries that they cannot free ride on the carbon budget. So what is happening now is if you don't declare that you claim your share of the carbon budget, so suppose I put up instead of uh, four thermal power plants, I put up uh, 50 renewable plants and I reduce the emissions which might have taken place, does that benefit come to us or it goes to someone else? So in fact, it goes to developed countries who are not reducing their emissions as they should. So I do all the work, but they reap the benefits. And this free riding has been happening ever since the 90s, since we signed the Climate Convention. So when India declares its carbon budget 
and says that it wants an equitable share, it is a very firm indication that we do not accept this free riding. And it has uh, important implications for carbon trading, etc. Low carbon innovation and development is not a choice, but a necessity. Uh, this is made very clear. And uh, uh, finally, the important point is made that everybody now talks of just transition. So just transition, many people simplistically, even in our country, especially in the bureaucracy and civil society, simplistically think it means immediate decarbonization. The document makes it clear that it is transition to a low carbon pathway of development and not immediate decarbonization. So let me go past uh, the others. Uh, all the usual things are there, including food and energy security, poverty eradication, etc. So what happened at COP27? I gave you this background because I think not only the international context, but also the context of India's policy is an important part of understanding, at least from our perspective, of what happened at COP27. So there were two significant threads that ran through the entire negotiations at COP27. The first was, uh, there was a major push by the developing countries to move away from a mitigation-centric agenda. All said and done, despite the heat and dust and the immediate con uh, you know, debates and differences of opinion, including with the COP presidency, which was uh, Egypt, you know, in a conference of parties, the presidency is in the driver's seat, so to speak, in an important way. And they are an important part of... Uh, should I stop for a minute? Okay. Uh, yeah. They are an important part of uh, the way the conference evolves. So, you know... Uh, working with the presidency, the presidency has a twofold uh, duty, so to speak. One part of it, it has its own vision of what we would like to see happen in the COP. The other thing is they are also responsible for producing a consensus. No country wants a COP, which is dubbed a failure. So, you know, so uh, it's a challenging thing, but nevertheless, we succeeded, I think, in retrospect, in important ways in moving away from a heavily mitigation-centric agenda. And this is absolutely important to billions of people across the uh, third world. There was a very clear acknowledgement, not necessarily through uh, articulating the carbon budget, but in a number of ways that a safe and livable world must be an equitable world. I think this message uh, ha, uh, appeared in the COP in, uh, in this conference of parties uh, at a level and scale, which I think uh, is unprecedented in many ways. And not just, I think, in terms of rhetoric or broad statements, but in terms of many specific actions which were undertaken. It was driven by a very strong coordination between uh, within the group, which is called G77 plus China. It includes all developing countries. Uh, this, of course, you know, there are many differences within, but uh, many of those differences were also overcome in the pursuit of uh, some very important common goals. Uh, even though overt mention of equity, as I said, was uh, often uh, objected to by developed countries in an extraordinarily, uh, I must say, sometimes very cynical fashion. But nevertheless, in practical terms, we could overcome it in uh, some ways. The second thread was... Uh, what in uh, the global media, unfortunately, even in India, is called uh, climate action. Uh, 
uh, in general, it is supposed to mean both all things to do with climate, mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage. In practice, when you see the word climate action, it actually means mitigation. Okay, this, uh, that's the way people use it. Uh, it was a very challenging thing for developing countries, but I think in a very important way, developed countries made it clear to uh, developing countries uh, made it clear to the developed, the global rich, that they must walk the talk. That you know they are not, uh, their uh, what they are doing, what they are supposed to do, keeping up with their commitments and responsibilities does not meet uh, uh, what they are supposed to be doing. However, a very important problem which has now surfaced, we have been aware of it for some time, several of us, that the bioresources of the third world are now seen as the site of mitigation. And this in particular to allow the global north to transition to a low emissions uh, uh, economy, but to do so in a manner that minimizes their disruption, is as comfortable as possible to them under the circumstances. And basically, to put it bluntly, you know, our forests are the dustbins of their carbon. I mean, that's about it, you know. Uh, if you want to put it very simply, our forests, our waters, our agriculture, all of it. Okay, and this uh, battle is now continuing in COP15 of the CBD. This COP15 of the CBD is extraordinarily important in this respect as well. So, what happened uh, uh, more specifically on loss and damage? Of course, everybody has read about it. There was major progress on loss and damage. Loss and damage uh, was not uh, was a time circumscribed agenda item that has been broken. It will continue to be under discussion. This is very important. There was an agenda fight. In fact, at the beginning of uh, the COP, the uh, developed countries wanted to put on board a discussion which in jargon is known as Article 21C. So Article 21C of the Paris Agreement says all financial flows should be aligned towards Paris target. What that means in practice is all our gas, oil, coal development will be shut off while their established uh, oil, gas and coal will continue to produce. That's what they are saying. And uh, Africa has been particularly hit, Bangladesh, was one of the first thermal projects to be shut down. Kosovo was another. So it's not as if it is happening in the first world. But uh, nevertheless, uh, that agenda item, they wanted it. It never appeared on the agenda. It has been relegated to a side discussion of whether uh, it should be, in fact, on the agenda later and so on. But loss and damage made it in a major way to the agenda. So, of course, the big uh, win was the, in principle, agreement to have a funding facility. But uh, this funding, the details are not clear. It is not clear where the money will come from. There are no commitments of the money. The process is unclear. And all of this to be settled as we go along is going to be difficult and contentious. But nevertheless, I think it's a very important point of principle because the Paris decision uh, in, uh, at the time of the Paris Agreement, the COP decision, uh, Article 51 of that decision says the developed countries reject any kind of liability or compensation for loss in terms of loss and damage. So it's not to be seen as liability or compensation for their over emission, their emissions beyond their fair share. Uh, that, of course, is, cannot be implicitly turned off, but the very recognition of loss and damage and funding for loss and damage is uh, turning one's back on this uh, loss and damage. So the holdout, of course, was the United States till the very last minute. 
there are a lot of people now in the media taking credit for how it happened. Uh, U.S. Uh, NGOs, civil, U.S. civil society, international civil society, everybody claims it is their credit. I think, but the chief credit goes to the fact that G77 and China were so completely firm on this going through that there was no way that this would not happen. And even before COP27, uh, it had attracted very powerful support, including the UN Secretary General, who otherwise is a very mitigation-centric uh, agenda person. But even he had made it very clear that there was no question of not having loss and agenda, loss and damage on the agenda. So, uh, so the COP decision firmly establishes a link between warming and loss and damage, and the IPCC's output uh, report makes a link between warming and responsibility through cumulative emissions. So I think this is a very important uh, point. On finance, the, the terrain has become very interesting, and I think this has not been noticed in the global media so far. Uh, one thing is that this promised uh, $100 billion per year, uh, which was a promise made at Copenhagen, mind you, for 17 years since the convention had been signed, and there was a commitment to provide finance that developed countries did nothing. Zero. So that last minute attempt by Obama at Copenhagen was what put this number on board. And 13 years after uh, Copenhagen and Cancun, this uh, figure has still not been reached. At COP26, the decision uh, final resolution said that uh, expressed regrets. This time it expressed grave concern. So every year until they pay up, we are going to be saying this. And this has, uh, you know, this is really going to continue. Uh, the other thing is a very landmark statement. For the first time, you see a cost estimate for the world, uh, which is uh, about how much mitigation will cost. And this is USD 4 trillion per year until 2030, uh, purely for renewables, 4 to 6 trillion per year for the low carbon transition, not necessarily till 2030. These are very large numbers, but you must see it in the context of a global economy and GDP growth. But we have to see, uh, this is probably A, an underestimate, and probably founded, as I already pointed out in those pathway, uh, et cetera. Uh, this is high, based probably on very inequitable allocation of these finances, okay, of this kind of investment across the world. But nevertheless, for the first time, we have a number. We have not had such a number before in a discussion. The number comes partly from the IEA. So I would take it with a block of salt on that account, but nevertheless. So para 20, 34 of uh, the uh, Sharm el Sheikh uh, main decision is an extraordinary paragraph. I was just telling Dr. Madhura that we ought to really think about it. It says accelerated financial support for developing countries from developed countries is critical to enhancing mitigation action. Uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi had already made this point in uh, COP26, now this is part of a decision. Addressing economic vulnerability to climate change for developing countries, uh, this uh, finance is critical. Inequities in access to finance must be addressed. And they have a list of what exactly that means in practice in the decision. Scaled up public grants for mitigation and adap adaptation for vulnerable regions, in particular sub-Saharan Africa, would be cost-effective and have high social returns. This is, uh, I think, a major victory. And I think uh, we ought to, especially those who are in development economics, we ought to celebrate this 
and we ought to see what this can be made to mean effectively in practice. It also, para 37 of the decision, has a very interesting call on to multi -develop, uh, multilateral development banks and international financial institutions. It says reform multilateral bank, uh, development bank practices and priorities, align and scale up funding, ensure simplified access, Mobilize climate finance from various sources. So, you know, they are the channels for mobilizing from the private. It's not just that private finance will come with bankable, you have to give them bankable project, but these institutions must mobilize finance on what terms with a new vision and a fit for a purpose operational model to address the global climate emergency. And this must be through instruments ranging from grants to guarantees and not de non-debt instruments, taking into account the debt burdens of developing countries. So this is an extraordinary agenda. And it is uh, remarkable that it is there in writing. And I think uh, uh, this will be contested in times to come. But uh, operationalizing this uh, gives a very uh, important focus. This ties in also with calls that BRICS, etc., have made in the past about the reform of the global financial architecture. So this, uh, so on uh, equity and CBDRRC, if uh, uh, if uh, we mention the words uh, developed country representatives would start almost choking or develop a rash. They were allergic in the extreme. There was an attempt to make Glasgow almost like Paris. So they kept talking about the Glasgow Climate Pact. So they said, okay, you can put in equity as in the Glasgow Climate Pact. So then, you know, develop, developing countries told them, you know, that's a bit too much, you know. So it has been put in its place. Uh, it took a while to do it. Uh, this I'll skip, it requires some. The major gain of the developing uh, developed countries is the appearance properly in uh, text of the question of nature-based solutions. Now, nature-based solutions is innocently understood as uh, utilizing nature where appropriate according to context, where suitable, effective, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for uh, adaptation and also for mitigation as feasible. But the whole point is, as I have already made it clear earlier, this idea of uh, our bioresources being the dustbins of their carbon. And so <clears throat> when you say nature-based solutions to climate change, uh, then uh, it really means that, uh, you know, uh, nature, uh, which is in fact going to be the victim of global warming, which is going to be impacted. Biomes are not going to stay where they are. Species are not going to be able to live where they are uh, located today. All kinds of latitudinal shift of uh, species and ecosystems is one of the key indicators of global warming. So what are you talking about? when you talk about nature-based solution. And uh, so ecosystems can turn around in their behavior as carbon sinks under increased warming through natural processes. So this whole thing is very problematic. It is qualified or ecosystem-based approaches, which is a coherent uh, scientific term. Uh, it refers to the UNEA resolution of March 2022, which also has some caveats, but nevertheless, this appearance is a, a problematic. One will be used by developed countries, multilateral financial institutions, and international NGO donors to mount pressure on developing countries. The other problematic aspect is there were multiple references to conserve, protect, and restore natural resources, specifically in the context of water, is a very problematic reference because it ignores any reference 
to sustainable use. The UNEA resolution talks about conserve, conservation, protection, restoration, and sustainable use. So this is a, a problematic thing. It happened for particular reasons. India, of course, uh, made it clear on various occasions our opposition and our continued, shall we say, because these are not mandatory in some sense. So we still have policy flexibility. So we will deal with it in times to come. Agriculture was at the center of attention. And I must say, some of us anticipate, fully anticipated this, though the scale of the pressure perhaps uh, to the less experienced was somewhat surprising. The developed countries made it very clear that they were in this discussion for mitigation. So they said it up front. They said if it was only adaptation, we wouldn't even be here talking to you about it. It will be under the adaptation commission, adaptation fund, et cetera, which is a separate track in the negotiation. So it was all about mitigation. Even though there are many caveats, many co things about context specific, national circumstances, various sort of, uh, you know, qualifiers have been put there. Nevertheless, this is the thing. It targets a significant global population, especially small and marginal farmers who have uh, contributed very little to warming, but who will bear the brunt of the impact. So as I said, these caveats and options are there. India worked closely with G77 to uh, ensure that they are put in. We nevertheless, India uh, wanted uh, further protection and ring fencing of uh, small holders from mitigation pressures. So there was a press statement which was quite tough issued on 18 November on behalf of the government of India. And even in the closing statement, uh, among the seven leading points of where India had not a formal reservation, but India expressed its opinion uh, on the final outcome, the minister made it clear that agriculture for India is the site of adaptation and not mitigation. So, G77 very prominently rejected the use of the term food system. Now, what is the difference between food system and food production system? See, if you have food systems, then uh, whether it is Walmart, whether it is Cargill, whether it is Reliance Fresh, whether it is, uh, you know, whoever, and the farmer are all placed on one level. They're all part of a system, right? And there are all these misleading statements about agriculture emissions, saying that agriculture accounts for 30% of all 33, 35% all emissions, where urea production, transport of frozen foods, everything is taken into account. Now, obviously, if you do that for uh, automobiles, then automobiles, if you take all the steel, coal, everything they use, we might even get a much higher figure. So I think uh, uh, the G77 was very clear. So that's important. A new, however, a new four-year program of Shamel Sheikh called the Shamel Sheikh Joint Work on Climate Action on Agriculture and Food Security has been initiated. Uh, what it will do, the broad objectives are laid out, but the content is as yet unclear. Engaging with this, I think, is very important. And we must do it in a progressive, democratic way, keeping in mind the uh, vulnerability of literally billions, you know, who are associated with this sector. Some caveats, as I said, are there, especially for far small farmers. Of course, there was this issue of uh, fossil fuel. So India took a principal stand, phase down of all fuels with uh, developed countries uh, taking the lead. So this was India's suggestion. It was not interpreted very often uh, in the press properly. But the European Union on uh, one side is... Uh, through one side of the mouth said, of course, we will back this proposal. The other side of the mouth, they said, 
the emphasis on coal from COP26 should remain. So in the event, uh, the uh, deal was uh, uh, to fall back on the Glasgow language because there was some agreement there uh, for better or worse. But uh, uh, this, especially after Mr. Timmermans was again in the lead on this from the European Union. And as I said, the hypocrisy of this, I think is now increasingly clear to the world. They sneaked in at the last minute, you know, nobody noticed. And you know, the negotiations have a logic of their own. This term low emissions, along with low emissions, uh, and renewable energy, okay, low emission sources, I think there's some word there, and renewable energy as the means to reduce emission. This, of course, is pandering to gas use in the global north. They all use gas. Their gas emissions are higher than our coal emissions, okay. Whether it is clean or not is not the matter. It is the emissions that matter. Their emissions are much higher. So this was a sneak attack, can be dealt with perhaps. Then uh, they are talking a lot about enhanced ambition and just transition. And so India made it clear that just transition for developing countries means uh, uh, low carbon development. Uh, the minister repeated it at the closing plenary after the decision text was passed. So in India, we are very clear what just transition means. And the LTS, which I referred to earlier, describes this in detail. So the whole story of this, if one has to summarize it very quickly, is that there is this constant changing of goalposts. So, you know, the Paris Agreement has a built-in mechanism of every five years that you review it and you enhance the... Uh, you know, well, whatever it is, your commitments and responsibilities. But no, you know, they can't wait five years. So we have not even finished the first review, which is the global stock take. So you have a work program on mitigation, enhanced ambition. You have a work program on just transition. You have to have meetings every year. You have to have four workshops per year, a ministerial dialogue every year. So basically you are writing reports uh, you are producing uh, reporting requirements, making submissions, monitoring arrangements. There's no support, no finance. And last but not least, no action. You know, the emissions are not reducing the way they should. So this is a, a real problem. And uh, uh, we saw it in full uh, form in uh, COP27. Oh, sorry, that should be COP. 27 on top. So India, I think uh, uh, we were not uh, targeted uh, as in COP26. I think uh, uh, India it is now fairly well established that India's mitigation efforts are reasonable. You know, you, we may domestically within the country argue on how much should be done, how it should be done, more or less, where, how, why, etc. But on the international stage, it is clear that uh, India is doing uh, uh, what it should, perhaps even more than what it should, given our uh, historical responsibility for warming. And uh, the fact that we are what we are in terms of emissions, very low, despite being 17% of the global population. So I think a very important shift uh, an evolving shift, these things are not in black and white, an important shift in uh, uh, climate policy for India is that equity is no longer simply a defensive strategy. There's this famous statement by the uh, specialist in climate policy and climate uh, international law, Dr. Lavanya Rajamani, who once said India uses equity as a shield and not a sword. So I think uh, we have crossed that. And uh, it is more often deployed, not only by India, but uh, some of our partners as well as the foundation of an equitable for a safe and livable world. We really need equity. So equity is a necessity. 
So here's a rapid uh, wrap up. I'll just uh, now conclude. There have been a lot uh, of uh, criticism of this COP from, unfortunately, from quarters that uh, we have uh, listened to with great respect in the past that the COP was a failure, etc. I would say nothing of the sort. First of all, this is utterly lacking in sympathy for that is due to a third world country that is holding a COP that sees also the COP as an opportunity to make policy gains on the international stage for developing countries. Uh, the extent of their success is not entirely in their hands, but all said and done, I think uh, Sham El Sheikh will go down uh, in the history of climate policy as where we got loss and damage finally going. And that I think is creditable. So this is one, many key developing country concerns were, you know, the text, there are all these little, little sentences which uh, appear, points which are made partly in the introductory part referred to as the chapeau, the French word for a cap. So, you know, that's the first part, the preambular part, so to speak, or also in the main text. Uh, they talk about food security, vulnerability of food production systems, and health. Health in a very specific way, in contrast to more general statements earlier. So all these are building blocks for the future. And these are valuable. It was a platform for loss and damage, adaptation and finance, where I think the record of COP27 is uh, fairly positive. So this, uh, on the mitigation in the biosphere sectors, I think uh, the problem is many, uh, quite a few developing countries also see it as a source of finance and technology. And uh, it, it, they consider it sometimes their contribution to mitigation. And uh, countries with huge resources of this at low levels of industrialization are policy-wise uh, attracted by this, but so India needs to engage these countries in a larger dialogue about how to position this uh, appropriately, this desire that they have in this, and also warn them of the problematic aspects of this policy. A multi-dimensional landscape of uh, equity is evolving. Earlier, equity seemed to be a purely mitigation-centric discussion. But after COP27, you realize you spoke about equity only in mitigation because only mitigation was on the agenda of discussion. So when you discuss only mitigation, equity will be only about mitigation. So if you put loss and damage, if you put adaptation, if you put finance, you put everything there, then equity fills out into a much broader developed uh, issue. So I think this is an important thing and we must uh, continue to focus on this. For us, particularly in our group and in our network of collaborations, etc., cetera, we, we consider this quite seriously. Last but not least, the developed world after 30 years of the convention signed in 1992, we are in 2022, has still to meet its commitment. Without their lead, without their resources, technological, financial, et cetera, the world will continue to be under threat. That's where we are, COP27. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Chairman. I think it was a uh, fascinating uh, presentation and uh, I think I'm sure there's lots of questions uh, from people seated here as well as online. Um, would there be a first question? Um, how many are online? 45 people who are joined online. Uh, so, gentlemen, uh, two questions. Uh, one is you said the LTS 
uh, has a discussion of six sectors, including agriculture. So agriculture is not in that? Oh, okay. okay. That's I'm right. Okay. Okay. Then anyway, you answer. Let me ask. So my question was, if agriculture is there, what is written or whatever? Uh, second thing is this, uh, you know, food system to food production system. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Because suppose we say that the processing, you know, like retail, obviously Walmart or shipping food from Australia to India is contributing a lot to emissions as compared to say cultivating. But then in mitigation, where will that sector come in? You know, we want that Walmart retail sector to go yeah. for mitigation, right? So these are the two questions, yeah. So, uh, okay. So uh, the first uh, part is the LTS uh, was actually uh, quite a detailed interministerial exercise. Uh, there were uh, task forces which were convened on these issues, headed by uh, quite senior uh, officials. Uh, the final document was vetted by uh, all the concerned ministries. And so, uh, and it also had expert and civil society participation. There were uh, two consultations held with uh, state governments so that state governments who also had the draft and could uh, comment. So it is the product of that exercise. So there were six sectors which were covered. So the first one was uh, energy. The second one was uh, uh, transport. The third one was uh, buildings and uh, urbanization. Carbon capture and storage was the, uh, was the uh, fourth. Uh, forest, forest was uh, another. What did, what did I miss? I missed one. <laughs> uh, Six of I just, uh, somebody look it up and see uh, what I missed. So this is the main uh, this thing. Uh, there was a seventh task force which worked uh, on questions of finance, uh, etc. Uh, and so this was the uh, landscape. So uh, so agriculture was very clearly the LTS has a brief section uh, on adaptation. Agriculture is firmly placed in that section. I must remind you that when India, India's NDC commitment in terms of emissions intensity, which is emissions by GDP, okay, that emissions above in the numerator does not include agriculture emissions. That's not our target. However, emissions is from agriculture are reported in our biennial update reports and in our national communication. So there is a very clear position that we have. The LTS has done nothing to change this. And so uh, this is the context uh, for agriculture. So I think uh, uh, irrespective of the political landscape domestically, I think uh, there is a, it's, my, it's a India's leading structural economic problem, our rural transition. And I think uh, there is broad acceptance of this in all quarters. So your other question, uh, food production versus food. Sale. Now you see, the tempt Developed countries have an economy-wide emissions reduction. How they do it is their business. Okay. And obviously, given the scale of emissions reduction that they should do to meet the demands of equity and meet the demands of a secure planet, uh, they have to cover all of this. The capacities of, say, of a big urea producer the capacities of those who transport the petrochemicals or the petroleum basis for uh, fertilizer manufacture. We gave up coal-based fertilizer some 50 years ago. Seems not a great idea now in retrospect, but that's water gone under the coom many years ago. So if all of this, their capacities, 
the profits they produce, their ability to invest, their command of technology is so extraordinary that to not differentiate between them and the farmer, and I include in this even the farmers of the first world. The Dutch farmers are out on the roads. There were 6,000 tractors going up and down the other day because the first restrictions, even in Netherlands, what they do is they put it on the farmer. And the rest of them, maximum they do is they are cycling to work. Okay. Now you do this and you tell the farmer, no, 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 you are responsible. I think uh, is really getting the story upside down. So I think uh, uh, the, this is, I think, uh, very important. Uh, the, the, uh, there is a lot of uh, traction, this issue, this term food systems uh, uh, has occurred in the FAO, regrettably, which really ought to know better, uh, given their uh, experience and the data that they possess. It is a, a darling of uh, this issue, is the darling of all this diet fads, veganism, organic farming, etc. So that the center of this is to see the farmer as somehow engaged in conservation. The farmer is a producer. The farmer has a livelihood to maintain. The farmer has to have assets. He needs some amount of asset accumulation. So that is why when you say conserve, protect, restore, use, Irrigation is the first uh, adaptation technique for increased temperature. So you don't have utilization in water. So I think uh, that's the kind of issue here. At the IPCC, this has been well discussed. And the IPCC Working Group 2 report, despite some ups and downs, has a, a much better uh, position on this. The, Summary for policymakers of working group two. We'll discuss this perhaps on another uh, occasion. Should we take one online and then come back? Yeah, to yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, myself, Dr. Hussain here. Yes, yes, yeah. Dr. Hussain. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, we are very much thankful for you for acquainting ourselves with very valuable knowledge and for your nice presentation. Sir, yeah, actually our Honorable Prime Minister has already promised that during 2075, uh, our uh, pollution level will come to zero. And we are uh, working on that line and uh, in agriculture and uh, industrial fields also, we, we are utilizing alternative energy systems as well as how to mitigate in a better way and we have gained some success also but my my question is where usa and china itself contributes more than 25 percent of all pollution is it possible for us to exactly. minimize it at a level or until and unless my question is until and unless the developed countries of their own go for reducing of the uh, pollution level, the wall cannot do it. What is your advice, please? I see, I will, I'll very quickly uh, respond to the first part. See, uh, in order to have some perspective on this, uh, uh, two years ago, it was 2020, right? 50 years ago, it was what? 1970. So the world of 2020, just to think of our daily life and 1970, but for uh, Dr. Hussein and myself is not something we don't remember. Huh? It's 50 years away. And in fact, I am going for my classroom reunion, uh, you know, of 50 years of my school leaving class in a couple of days. So the world was so different. So when you say 50 years from now, it's like saying, you know, one day eventually we will die, so I will go and sit in the burning gut now. You know, we can't do that. I think uh, the foundation of reaching net zero has to be built on development. That is very clear. You know, being, uh, shall we say, close to nature, quote unquote, 
in a state where you have low assets, low wealth, low incomes, low human development levels, will leave you more vulnerable, but will not help the world or society. So I think for India, I repeat our task is development and adaptation as the first line of defense. We will proceed where possible in low carbon development, but we have to have a sense of balance. So you cannot say tomorrow I need 100 ambulances and somebody comes to you and says, oh, 100 ambulances, they should all be electric vehicles. That won't work. So this uh, I agree, but on the other hand, uh, Dr. Hussein, you are an expert in agroforestry. Yeah, so agroforestry is equally, you know, that kind of thing is important. Finally, the fact is, we, our climate action must take into account the fact, as economists say, that climate change is a global collective action problem. So we cannot make self-sacrifices. Actually, we intellectuals will sacrifice on behalf of the people and they will pay for it. So self-sacrificing does not work in a collective action situation. So we have to have a better uh, attitude to it. Otherwise, your point is well taken. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, sir, for the enlightening presentation. Uh, in your uh, um, slide on agriculture, impact on agriculture, you mentioned the four-year strategy, that is the FAST food agriculture sustainable transformation. So in that, what is the process and how adaptation and mitigation actions are being balanced uh, in the strategy? That is one. And second, with reference to low carbon development, how what is the um, take of the Indian government in promoting in agriculture sector? So two things. Uh, one is in our, the second part first, in our LTS, agriculture is not under mitigation. That's very clear. But of course, we recognize mitigation co-benefits. We have the PM Kusum program. Uh, we have all this uh, neem-coated urea. Hopefully, it does what it is supposed to do. Uh, you have, uh, uh, say, uh, you know, multiple aeration in uh, paddy cultivation instead of continuous flooding. But you see, you must turn the page and look carefully. Even yesterday, I was hearing the ICAR uh, uh, inventory experts. So when you do multiple aeration, you have a yield penalty. So we have to stay focused on that part of SDG2, which everybody forgets. Double income, double productivity. So this, I think, broadly still is uh, Government of India policy. With regard to what will happen in the UNFCC, it is still up in the air. If you look at the actual text of the decision, which I can circulate, you will see that there are uh, broad objectives. So by 27th March, various countries are supposed to make submissions on uh, uh, proposals for how to take this agenda forward. And there will be a discussion. It will be a process. So work won't start immediately, but we need to be engaged with it, especially here at MSSRF. Uh, where uh, we are very interested in this question. And then about the four-year strategy. <laughs> it's all up in the air. So we, we have to make it concrete and uh, it's not as if things are ready to launch. It is just broadly even defining at an international level what are concerns, how to exist. One very important thing which will happen immediately is an online portal. It will be called the Sham El Sheikh uh, portal. It is a portal for exchanging experiences uh, in climate action in agriculture, broadly speaking. So that we can expect will start off immediately. And uh, a lot of it will be dialogue and interaction. The secretariat is supposed to be producing a report here on the level of activity on these issues. This, unfortunately, will become a monitoring reporting mechanism and uh, eventually a stick with which to uh, go after developing countries. That is unfortunately the possibility. But it's up in the end. Yes. There are several questions. Yeah. 
Yeah, let him take a thing. Yeah, you can decide because there are several questions. Come down to the top. So then you can decide. Starts from here. So I think a uh, uh, small. Uh, I think. Yeah. Uh, to the uh, friend uh, who wants to know uh, what is the way a small agriculturist can uh, contribute that requires a specific discussion. I don't, uh, we are not aware of your circumstances, your location and context. So it will depend on that. A conversation later at MSSRF, perhaps, if there is an occasion, would help clarify. But we can't do this uh, yeah. immediately. So we have, uh, Rajamarikam is asking about the effect of bioresources mitigation development pathways. Uh, will, uh, uh, but, uh, Mr. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Rajamanikam, uh, former uh, T college uh, professor, will it not our existing developmental pathway affect bioresources uh, mitigation. mitigation. First thing it will affect is adaptation and not mitigation. Second thing is, it is not true that in India, uh, the forests are under threat, uh, like the way people talk about the Amazon, etc. Even the Amazon, we better check what exactly is happening. For instance, we have 2% of forest cover of the world. Forest fire incidents, we account for only 1%. So it's not as if, you know, a forest or a blaze, okay? It is vegetative cover is increasing, partly because of carbon fertilization, partly because eventually we are focused on conservation forestry and not production forest. So that has helped. Now, the problem is our domestic debate gets into how you should do it here, do it there, etc. But sometimes, literally, we miss the wood for the trees in this case. So I think our developmental pathway is a necessity. Uh, the term developmental pathway is always, unfortunately, loosely used. Uh, you should respect environmental laws but it, uh, and regulations. But at the same time, it cannot be that not a single tree will be cut, not a blade of grass removed, not a inch of pasture land overturned. This is not going to happen. So we have to be realistic and uh, there are ways to do it. And we need, uh, uh, we need to find ways forward rather than appeal to ideas of no growth or degrowth. Okay, look at Vikram's questions. He's got two. First, from an IPR perspective. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. I'm sorry to say, but I think IPR, unfortunately, those issues are very difficult to push with developed countries. One would have thought of after COVID-19, they had learned some lesson that, you know, overcoming IPR barriers is good for the world. That's the big lesson of uh, COVID-19. Unfortunately, I am not... Uh, so were there uh, any provisions or negotiations that happened in COP regarding uh, transfer of sustainable... Said, there were discussions. I am not an expert. Okay, but, second uh, question. And to some extent, they were not center stage, but they may be important developments. Uh, I am not qualified to comment. The second one. Of late, of late there's, there is a spike in the terms of... I think... Uh, uh, that is uh, really uh, uh, the circular economy and climate change are not directly related. They are indirectly related. People confuse the two. Uh, circular economy is a general environmental question. All of it does not affect uh, climate mitigation and adaptation. So confusing the two is unfortunate. So uh, otherwise, that's a separate discussion. Juhi Chatterjee, she has uh, on the implication of states in India declaring carbon neutrality targets, especially in the context of achieving development goals and poverty. In context to Tamanad, we have set carbon net zero targets and have also mm -hmm. set targets. So this is about Target. state versus center. Ah, okay, let me take uh, both uh, uh, Ms. Juhi Chatterjee and uh, Komal. Uh, Ms. Komal. Uh, uh, together. First is, see, net zero enthusiasm is all very well. 
You see, like I said, but it is 50 years away. What is unfortunate is that after COP26, we have this extraordinary discussion in parliament where both sides of the house were all for net zero. Some saying you must do more, others saying we are doing whatever we can, but whatever it is, they were all for it. I do not recall in memory. Okay. I have followed parliament willy nilly for several decades that we had a net zero discussion on hunger, where both sides of the aisle said, What is a roadmap? Give me a roadmap. Did we have, have we had a, a, this is a zero malnutrition discussion with the same intensity? Zero poverty. You want net zero by 2070? My question is, when is poverty zero? 2050? 2100? 2075? After net zero? Now, this is the issue. Now, within this, states declaring net zero, first of all, forget the politics of it. Now, CM, you know, chief ministers, ministers, everybody wants to show they are doing something in climate change. And unlike the United States, where everybody is trying to show they are not doing anything on climate change, in India, everybody is trying to show they are doing something on climate change. So I don't want to say that's a bad thing. That's a good thing. But on the other hand, Tamil Nadu is not a country. Kerala is not a country. Bihar Pollution Control Board chairman signs an MOU with the Shakti Sustainable Foundation for Bihar to be net zero by 2040. 2040, this is before Pradhan Mandri said 2017 in Glasgow COP, two years before that. Minangadi Panchayat declared its intention to be uh, net zero at the earlier. I was in the Kerala State Planning Board when these announcements were being made. My point is, forget about the enthusiasm. What does it even mean? So scientifically and economically, technologically, it is not a coherent idea. So India has an NDC target uh, of emissions intensity of GDP. This emissions intensity of GDP target, can you break it up across the states? We cannot even measure state GDP properly. How will you measure emissions intensity? So if I buy power from Jharkhand, huh, then it is Jharkhand's fault. So Jharkhand's emissions intensity of GDP is high. Whereas I am using the power, Jharkhand is trying to make some money from resources. So we are uh, willy-nilly for all the factors of federalism, which we all value in our polity and economy, decision-making. And these are all sectors where federalism is important. It is adaptation, which is the key. Tamil Nadu particularly is already a leader in renewable. In fact, we are suffering because uh, we are a leader in renewable because the other states are not keeping to their renewable purchase obligation. So the four southern states of Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and Andhra are paying more by way of electricity. The consumers, the tune of something like 1,500 crores per year because of our early entry into renewable. So this is the uh, kind of situation we have. So in this context, I think, Individual net zero targets are not even coherent. So, for instance, uh, this other one, like the renewable and uh, non fossil fuel based uh, power uh, installed capacity target, unless we have a balance. So, Jharkhand is where all our coal is. So, tomorrow, Jharkhand says, you know, you are scoring me low on climate action. So I am not going to produce any coal-based power. In fact, there are people trying to persuade uh, the CM of Jharkhand to declare such a policy, coal phase out in Jharkhand. If you coal phase out in Jharkhand, what will the Indian economy do? So this, I think, uh, 
we are an integrated economic unit. Even the European Union for all its streams, or even the United States, United States is a scene of chaos. But, you know, that's hardly a model for a developing country. But even in the EU, coordination is very important. So similarly, I think uh, we need, what we need is, yes, there should be enthusiasm for low carbon development. Nobody doubts that. But this should go with equal enthusiasm for development and adaptation. For our population of 1.2 billion, adaptation is the key for somewhere close to 600, 800 billion, some 67, 66%, two thirds of the population. So this should be the perspective and uh, you know, we will see how it proceeds. All the right noises have been made in the uh, program of the uh, brochure of the Tamil Nadu climate change mission. So we will see how it plays out in uh, practice. I just want to know whether you're taking uh, Sashikala's and I think she just has the last two questions. If there's, if some of it you've already answered, but if there is anything you left out. See, yeah, carbon credit, uh, carbon mechanism. credit mechanism, the others are more standard. So I think I have answered them in some way or the other. Yes. Uh, carbon credits, you see, carbon credit, now that, you see, when you look at the media, especially media reporting on big economic policy, the fashion of the day comes. So if you had looked at it 10 years ago, or even five years ago, oh, carbon credit, carbon trading is the way to go. Now, today, I saw an article in Politico, that very important political uh, analysis uh, magazine, saying that the Europeans are useless, they have forgotten, they are uh, very scared of Biden's uh, Inflation Reduction Act, because Biden's Inflation Redun uh, Reduction Act which is have to have climate mitigation benefits is driven by subsidies. So they are saying, oh, they don't appreciate this. And uh, they, because Europe is too tied in to carbon trading, they are missing out on an opportunity. Five years ago, if we had said subsidies, they have said, oh, what subsidy? One year ago in COP, and it was repeated in COP27, they are saying phase out inefficient subsidies. Obviously, it means Mr. Biden's subsidies are uh, efficient and Mr. Modi's are not, or Mr. Xi Jinping's are not. So this is the situation. So carbon credit, to come to the uh, perspective for India, India, what we lack is carbon space. We don't have a sufficient carbon budget. The carbon budget is vanishing every year, rapidly being depleted. It means how much allowed emissions, how rapidly we should decarbonize. So this is being depleted at a fantastic, at an enormous rate. And we have no control over it. So in this situation, what we need is not to sell whatever emission rights we have, but in fact to acquire them. And here the real danger of carbon credits in the biosphere, in agriculture, forest, what in uh, UNFCC is called the AFOLU sector, uh, agriculture, forests, and land use uh, sectors. Here what will particularly happen is that it will be sold cheap. So India should use carbon trading within domestically, we can use it maybe usefully. That still we have to see about how it will balance across different states. But internationally, we have to highly regulate it. We must not sell it cheaply. We must wait for carbon prices to rise sufficiently high. So even if we use it to acquire technology or finance at some point, we should do it in a manner that benefits us. Okay. So this, I think, is the bottom line. Uh, but then there is a huge amount of detail. And this is uh, something which is 
uh, the subject of ongoing discussion and nego even negotiations at the UNFCC. It's called Article 6 of the Paris Agreement, Article 6.2, 6.4, and 6.8. And very importantly, India with other developing countries is an important promoter of Article 6.8 methods of cooperation, which is not trading, but purely voluntary non-market approaches. So a government of India policy is that purely market-driven approach will not work. So this is the uh, thing. I think it's 12.30. <laughs> I think uh, we are done with all the questions online as well as, uh, are there anything here that no? Okay, so thank you. I think Dr. Jairaman, I, I'm sure everybody here is uh, very uh, happy to have had you unpack the whole COP27 for us and for those online. And uh, very, very much appreciate the responses you've given to all the questions uh, to everybody, I think even online as well as here. So thanks so much for this time and the opportunity to understand the negotiations behind COP27 and the decisions. Um, thank you so much then. And also the media who are present, thank you very much for joining us online. Our seminar now is closed for the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.